Well, you know the drill. It's the new year. So that means a lot of people are making New Year's resolutions. They're setting new goals for their life. They're grabbing at new vision and direction and all of these things and taking advantage of new opportunities and failing. That's just the cold, hard truth. I'm not trying to be Debbie Downer, and excuse me if your name is Debbie or Downer. No offense. It's just the truth. Statistics show that 80% or more who make New Year's resolutions and set goals at the beginning of the year fail. That's, that's reality, okay? And then when I say fail, I'm not talking about fail by the end of the year or fail sometime between this January and next January. I'm talking about fail between now and the second week of February. We have a tendency to make it only about six weeks or less. I think we can do better than that. Now, this is not a message about personal goal setting or New Year's resolutions, but I just wanted to throw that out there because the reason we, we miss out on realizing our goals is because, and there's probably a lot, but three main reasons. One, our goals are typically unrealistic. It's just, it's just too big to sort of wrap our minds around to achieve. Sometimes our goals are not measurable. We have no way to track it. We don't know what progress looks like. We don't know if we're succeeding. And then number three is typically when we set goals, we fail because we don't incorporate accountability. We don't let other people know what it is we hope to achieve and for them to ask us or give them permission to hold us accountable. We just sort of go at it alone. So when we fail, we've only let down ourselves, and nobody's going to ask us about it, so we're like, oh, it wasn't worth it anyway. Again, I think we can do better than that. And I'm not just talking about on the individual level. I'm talking about on a church level. Because, see, the church has goals, too. At least every church should have goals. Um, I believe that Jesus gave us two overriding, overarching goals that we all need to be mindful of. One is to engage the culture. Jesus has given us the responsibility to connect with the world around us in a way that makes a difference. Another goal is to enlarge the kingdom. To see people coming into and becoming a part of His kingdom. I think every church... Everything that every church does in some way, shape, or form should be an effort to achieve one or both of those goals because those are given directly from the Lord Jesus to the church. And we find those in a place that we call the Great Commission. It's in Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 19. Let me read it for you. Jesus said, Go and make disciples. In other words, go into the world, be a difference maker, and make disciples, enlarge the kingdom of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. If you just go a little further into the New Testament, to the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8, you'll see that Jesus doubles down on that particular challenge when He says, But you will receive power... When the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria to the ends of the earth. I believe that kingdom growth, enlarging the kingdom of God, is the number one goal of the church. That is our primary reason for existing. And now you may ask, well, what is kingdom growth? Very simply here, before I get too much further into the message. Kingdom growth is simply seeing and leading others to know Christ and to follow Him. Right? That, that's what I'm talking about when I mention kingdom growth. Leading others to know Christ and seeing them follow Him right? as they become disciples. The question that we want to give our attention to today is what is it going to take to achieve that goal. If that is our primary goal, what's it going to take to make it happen? 
And I'm just going to give you the answer right up front, but I don't expect anybody to leave. I'm not going to stop preaching. Okay, i got a whole sermon here. But I'm going to go ahead and give you the gist of it right up front here. So just, just bear with me. But what's it going to take to achieve this major goal of the church? You ready for it? The answer is everyone. Everyone. It's going to take every single person in the church seeing him herself as being responsible for contributing to the overall growth of the church and of the kingdom of God. And now you're going to hear that word responsible several times throughout this message because, one, I want us to leave here today understanding that we all have a certain level of responsibility. But not only that, I want us to leave today knowing exactly what that responsibility is, what it looks like, and how we can know if we're achieving it, if we're fulfilling that responsibility. But first, follow with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It's a New Testament letter of Paul. And I'm going to sort of give you where the foundation of all this is, is coming from. Paul speaks about the church here in 1 Corinthians 12, and he makes this statement. He says, you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Now, the context, Paul's talking about spiritual gifts and the use of spiritual gifts in the church. The major theme that that is wrapped up in is the idea that the church is the body of Christ. Another way to think about that, that might be a, a little easier for us, is to think about the church as a family. All right? and, and as a family, each person who is a member has certain responsibilities. And, and we all need to be fulfilling our responsibilities in order to benefit the whole family. You know, if, if every part of the body works to benefit the whole body, then the whole body is in, is in good health. It's just like your family at home. Every single person in the family has a role to play, has responsibilities to carry out, has duties, chores, whatever it might be. And ideally, everyone is participating in that. And no one person, mom, dad, or whoever, no one person is responsible to carry out all of the duties of the household. Um, I was just recently talking to a couple guys in our church, and it was on a Sunday afternoon, <clears throat> back before Christmas, and I was explaining to them that I had my two girls, who are eight and one is about to turn five in February, had my two girls go through and put out all of the Christmas invite ornaments that were in the seats a few weeks ago. You remember we used those, the red in and so their job was to go down every row and put an ornament in every seat so that they would be here in your seat when you got here. But there was a certain way I wanted those ornaments in the seats. I didn't want them to just go through, just throw out a bunch of ornaments and it looked like a big mess. I made them take each ornament and put it in the center of every seat. And so that when you look down a row, it would look uniform. It would look presentable. It's attractive. Everything looks uh, nice and orderly. And then I went in behind them, and if I noticed a row of ornaments that looked like, you know, a snake in the grass, then I'd make them come back and fix it so that it'd be straight. And those guys, I was telling them about that, and they just laughed, and, and they was like, man, you, you're pretty hard on your girls, aren't you? I said, absolutely. Absolutely. Not just here, but at home, wherever. Now, don't get me wrong. I know they're just kids. They have plenty of opportunity to be kids. I let them get by with more than enough to allow them the freedom to be kids. But I have a high level of expectation when it comes to them fulfilling personal responsibility. Whether it's at home, and, and the way their room is kept, uh, whether it's at church and sharing in responsibilities and, and serving here at church. It might be you know, at school, responsibilities, or in public with their behavior. And I don't let them by with just slacking off. There, there's no room for slacking off and just expecting mom or dad or somebody else you know, to make up the rest. 
that, there's just too much to do. And I try to explain that to them. There's too much to do. There's too many responsibilities for you to get to do what you want to do and expect somebody else to do what you should be doing. So we're all going to participate and share in that load. Okay? All right. That, that's, how I, that's how I run my house. And by run, I don't mean I, I dictate. And, you know, that kind of, I know it feels that way, but, but I do keep things in line. All right. I'm digging myself a little hole here. But anyway, I, I'm trying to make a point. See, the church, not just this church, but the whole, has a great responsibility. Jesus said, go into the world, make disciples of all nations. Teach them what I've taught you. Teach them to follow me. That's huge. And the success of the church depends upon each person sharing in that responsibility, taking ownership of that, realizing that we all have a part to play. But here's the thing. Paul mentions there's a second part to the equation. In verse 26, he says, If one part suffers, every part suffers. You see, a lot of times we focus on positive statements because they feel good, they're nice, uh, they motivate us. But there's something about a negative statement that we shouldn't ignore, that we shouldn't suppress. I, I know negative statements don't make us feel nice, fuzzy, and warm, but there's something about a negative statement that can motivate. And Paul makes it here in 1 Corinthians 12. 26. We know that the success of the church depends on every part doing their part. He says, but don't forget, if every part doesn't do their part, we suffer. We suffer. We all hurt. We are not as good as we could be if everyone's not fully participating. So I'm just going to, I'm not even, I haven't even gotten into the real meat of the message yet. All right, I'm just warming up. That's why you were standing out in the foyer waiting to get in. Yeah. I just want to make this challenge right up front. Don't be that member. Don't be that person, the weakest link, the one who assumes that everybody else is going to do it. Don't assume that the responsibilities of the church, the growth of the church, the growth of the kingdom is the job of the pastors, the staff members, the elders, the volunteers. It's somebody else's. No, it's yours. It's mine. It's our responsibility. And so regardless of what anybody else does or doesn't do, let's all make it our goal this year to share in the responsibility of our church so that together, and this is the payoff, this is the, world, the reward, so that together... We can participate in the success. We can watch people come to know Christ and grow up and follow Him. Isn't that exciting? We can all participate in that if we all share in the responsibility. So how do we do that? You might be asking, well, I understand. I see what, what the Bible is saying there, and I know that I have a responsibility. How can I do that? How can I share in the growth of my church? One, there's three, three simple things. One, pray for its growth. None of these are difficult, but they're highly impactful. Pray for the growth of your church. Remember, I said two main goals of the church. One, engage the culture. In other words, connect with the world in a way that makes a difference. Number two, enlarge the kingdom. The first is a segue to the second. The second is the greatest goal, to enlarge the kingdom, to see people come to know Christ and follow Him. But before we do either of those, before we engage anybody, connect with anybody, or do anything that would make any kind of a difference, we can begin to pray. And we can pray individually, and we can pray independently. I can pray regardless of any, is if it, whether or not anybody else is praying. I can pray, and it doesn't matter what anybody else does. You could be doing something else. We can pray individually, 
and independently for the growth of our church. And I think this is a, a model that's set forth in Scripture. And Paul talks about this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2. He says, We always thank God for all of you continually mentioning you in our prayers. So he and those who traveled with him had a regular habit of praying for the church. And he wrote this letter to the church at Thessalonica and told them, you know, we spend time individually praying for the growth and the well-being of you, the church. In Ephesians chapter 1, he, he says something very similar to them, but he adds to it some specifics. He says in verse 16, he says, I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know Him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which He's called you, the riches of His glorious inheritance in His holy people, and His incomparably great power for us who believe. Think about what Paul just said there. He essentially gave us several things that we can specifically be praying for as it pertains to our church. You see, I could easily just stand up here and say, pray for the growth of your church. You understand that, but you might be in a place where you're like, well, what does that look like? How do I do that? Do I just simply pray, God, grow the church? Well, maybe. It can be that simple. But Paul actually said, here are some things that you can, some items you can be praying for. He said, pray for the church to be given wisdom. All right, the leadership to be given wisdom. And he said, revelation or vision. Pray that the church, the hearts of the people, will be open and enlightened to know God, to know Him more. That we will understand the hope that we have in Christ. He says, Pray that, that our knowledge will be increased to understand the purpose of God for us. The, the provision that God has made for us. And, and he says even the power that we have as followers of Christ to carry out that purpose he's given us. Pray for those things. Wisdom, vision, power, purpose. All of these things aid to the growth and the health of the church. And, and we can do that by ourselves. Every single person can do that. And I think that's important. But it's also important that we not only pray independently and individually, but corporately, together with other believers. You know, a lot of Sundays, um, Billy and Andrea and some of these others who lead worship for us, they may in the middle of a song or after or before a song, uh, stop and pray. And it's my hopes, and I really believe this is the case for them, that it's not just that prayer is a segue to the next song, sort of fill the gap kind of thing. Uh, it's my, my prayer that it is their effort to join us together, to unite us at that moment in prayer. And so I hope that what you'll do from now on is, is say when somebody from the stage begins to pray during worship or something, you'll take that opportunity to join with them, you know, corporate prayer, to join with them, to agree with them in faith concerning what it is they're praying for, or perhaps at that moment to just lift up prayers for the church or, or needs that, that people that you know might have. There's something about corporate prayer. There's something about praying with other believers about the needs of others and the needs of the church that, that moves God to action. This is one of the things, one of many things, but one of the things that the early church did that I believe was a major contributor to their growth and their success. Let me read for you in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It says that they, talking about the church, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayers. Four things that they did right there. And, and Luke mentions that one of those things was prayer, corporate prayer. What was a result of these things? Verse 47. And the Lord added to their number daily. 
You get that daily, not, not weekly, not every Sunday or monthly, daily. God added to their number those who were being saved. You see how easy it is to share in the responsibility and contribute to kingdom growth? You simply pray. You pray for the growth of your church. You pray for the growth of the kingdom of God. Another thing we can do is, is as we pray, we begin to, to activate that prayer with doing something. And that's number two, which is invite the unchurched to attend. Invite the unchurched to attend. As I was writing this, I thought about uh, a quite a large multi-site church in South Carolina that I've followed them for years and just sort of watched what they've done and I've admired a lot of their, uh, of their growth and, and just things that they've uh, really set forth uh, on the church stage. And uh, they're, they're a church that likes to change a lot of things really often and they keep their church and the people on their toes. You never know what's going to be different the Sunday you walk in. Um, one of the things that they changed here in the last few years was how they communicated their core values, what their church really was about and stood for. Uh, they didn't necessarily change those beliefs. They just changed how they communicated those. They've since changed them again. But one thing that I remember about this particular uh, initiative was they communicated their core values with some very simple, short phrases that were easy to remember, easy for people to relate to. And one of those that had to do with inviting people to church was this phrase, found people, find people. That was it. They were, they were communicating the responsibility of every believer of Christ, every follower of Christ, to invite others. And they said it, found people, find people. And, and if you are a follower of Christ... You need to understand that you are a found person. That's the way the Bible describes us. The Bible says that those without Christ are lost. Jesus is not the one who's lost. We are. And so I know that we talk about, you know, that day when I found Jesus. I get it, and I'm not, you know, raining on your parade or anything, but you didn't find Jesus. He found you. We are found people. We're lost. Okay? Let's just get that straight. But anyway, as a found person... We have this responsibility to find others, to go out and find other people who don't have a relationship with Christ, who are not plugged into a church, and in essence, bring them to Christ so that they too can be a found person. All right, that is a very simple and non-intimidating way to think about evangelism. Because I know like when, when I say, hey, you know, we all need to be evangelists, he's like, oh my God, I can't do that. You know, only Billy Graham can do that. Well, this is another way to think about the same principle. Find, found people, find people. That's it. It's very biblical. And I want to show you in John chapter 1 just how simple and how biblical this is. If you will, turn with me there. If you've got a Bible, phone, whatever, or follow me on the screen here. As I read these verses, here's what I want you to do. You can mark them in your Bible. It, it doesn't matter. But if you don't have any way to do that, just in your mind... Mark instances, words and phrases that would support this idea that found people find people. Okay, As I just read through this, starting in verse 35 of John chapter 1. It says, The next day John, who's John the Baptist, the next day John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you'll see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent a day with him. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You're Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him. 
we found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked. Come and see, said Philip. Did you, did you catch on to a pattern there? Found people found other people and simply said, come and see. We've got that same responsibility. We've been given that very same task. Those of us who know Christ should be actively looking for and inviting those who need to know Christ. That is the heart of God. That is the heart of Jesus. It doesn't have to be anything that we overcomplicate. It doesn't have to be anything that we're afraid of. And if you don't know what to say, say exactly what they said. Come and see. Jesus said that. Andrew said that. Philip said that. You don't have to answer all the questions. You don't have to have a hundred Bible verses memorized. Hey, it's great if you do. But simply say, come and see. You want to know what Christianity is all about? You want to know what New Life Church is all about? You want to know what following Jesus is like? Come and see. Come and see. It's just that simple. It's non-threatening. It doesn't obligate the person you've invited to anything. Come and see. That's all you have to do. Again, that's God's heart. That's his, that's his passion. Jesus told this story in Luke about this man who had a banquet. He invited a lot of people. And everybody that he invited either didn't show up or came back with an excuse of why they couldn't go. In the story... The man who was throwing the party is God. Specifically, Jesus and his relation to the nation of Israel. They are the invited guests. But as we can see through the Gospels, his invitation wasn't acted upon and, and they rejected him. They didn't show up for the party. That angered the guy who was throwing this banquet. And he told his servants, I want you to go out into the roads, the highways, the country lanes, wherever, and invite anybody you come in contact with so that my house can be full, so we can have a huge party. Anybody that wants to come, you go get them. And there's a couple of things that we can learn from that story. One, before we came to know Christ, we were those ones out there in the roads, the country lanes, and the highways. Somebody had to come find us. And invite us to come in. Once found, now we are the servants. We are being compelled to go out and find others. Friends, family members, neighbors, co-workers. Those we go to school with. And invite them. You now come and see. Come be a part. So that his house may be full. This is what... Jesus said in the story, The master told his servants, Go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. That is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. So that my house may be full. Just look around. Isn't it exciting when his house is full? See, that's what just blows my mind when people tell me, you know, I'm going to go uh, to another church or, or I really don't want to be a, a part of a big church where a lot of people are. Listen, you know, I know we all have preferences, but to have a perspective that the church should not grow is unbiblical. If the church is not growing, if the church is not full, something's wrong. Something is wrong. I don't want to be a part of something that is unhealthy because healthy things grow, right? And I've even gone so far, and I told one person, listen, if you don't like being around a lot of people, you're probably not going to like heaven <laughs> because the Bible says there's going to be a lot of people there. But unfortunately for you, hell's not going to be any better because there's going to be more people there. <laughs> you're screwed all the way around. Sorry if you got younger ones in here. 
That wasn't in the first service. But anyway, one thing I think we can do to, uh, to really keep our minds focused on this responsibility, keep it in the front of our minds throughout the year, because I don't want this to be just a, you know, a flash in the pan, a one-hit wonder kind of message. I want it to last all year. And so, and this has sort of been in my spirit for six months or more. I've been throwing it around with the staff and just getting some, some ideas. Uh, but this year and today, we're kicking off an initiative that we're calling. It's back here behind me. It's on your notes. It's the title of today's message, everything. Every member make a member. I want that to sort of be our goal and our theme for the year. And it doesn't mean that every single Sunday we're going to mention it or, or that we're going to preach a, a message on inviting or evangelism or church membership every single Sunday or anything like that. But I want that to be at the forefront of our minds from now through the end of this year that we all have a responsibility, every single one of us who calls New Life Church our church, we have a responsibility to go out and make a member, to invite somebody, to be a, a found person who finds other people. I don't want to be the weakest link. I don't want to be the one who shrugs off responsibility. I want to be the one who, who shares, who participates. All right? And so the primary goal, you, you can make it your goal to say, I'm going to get 10 people in, whatever. Start with one. And see, this, is, this has all the markers of a successful goal. It's clear. It's realistic. I mean, I'm not saying go out and, and you know, make 50 members. Everybody does that. Just one. It's realistic. It's measurable. If there's more people coming, we'll know it. We'll notice, right? And it's, it's got accountability built in. Because if you look around and you start seeing new faces, well, somebody invited them. And if you've invited no one, then maybe you'll be like, huh, maybe I should do something. Maybe I should be a part of this. It's got built-in accountability. It's got all of the marks for success. And so all we have to do is like Peter, like John, like Andrew, Nathaniel, even Jesus. Just go out and find people and say, hey, come and see. You never know how powerful that invitation can be and what a difference it can make. And I want to give you a couple examples here. These are, these are true, real-life stories, why I brought some pictures with me this morning. If you'll put that first one up on screen here. Over here on my left is Kira. Um, her and Casey, that's her husband, um, when Kira started coming to church here several years ago, they weren't a thing. They weren't married. Now they are. They're married and you know, have, have a child together. Um, but here's what happened. Kira started coming to church here by herself, fell in love with our church, got plugged in, started volunteering with Kids Life, she loved it. So eventually she found Casey and, and brought him in. But that's another part of the story. But Kira, she went out and she started talking to a co-worker of hers. And if you'll show this picture. She started talking to Lacey over here on the right. So Lacey and Kira, they worked together. Lacey and her husband, Derek, they were looking for a church. Kira says, I found a great church. You ought to come check it out, right? Come and see. Well, Lacey and Derek, they said, yeah, what's to lose? We'll go try it out. They came. They fell in love with our church, got plugged in. Both of them now volunteer in Kids Life. But that, the, the story doesn't end there. Lacey, she went out, did the same thing that Kira did, and she invited this next picture, the Osbournes, Lacey and Brandy, are stepsisters. The Osbournes were looking for a church as well. Lacey, just like Kira, she says, hey, found a great church. Come and see. Come check it out. Come give it a try. The Osbournes came. They fell in love with our church. They're right over here. Told y'all y'all going to be center stage today. So now 
we have Brandy, Cameron, Dax, Creed, and they have added to their family a little Fida down here at the bottom that they adopted from Haiti. And see, Brandy and her family not only got plugged in our church, but Brandy is our volunteer missions coordinator. She's the one, all these trips we talk about to Haiti, she's the one who plans those, coordinates those, makes sure that everything's in line so that our team has what we need to go to and from Haiti. One person, one person ends up adding to our church nine people. One found person went out and found nine. How incredible is that? And we are having an impact from that all around the world. It was Brandy who brought to me the idea of going international with our missions and doing orphan ministry in Haiti. See, if it wasn't for Kira, who invited Lacey, who then invited Brandy, we may not be in Haiti. We, not, we may not be having an impact with international missions. I mean, it's just amazing what God can do with a simple invitation. Come and see. This next couple, we have... Uh, Matt and Tabitha Hamilton. Uh, Matt and Tab, they originally were in the Greensboro area. Matt's from here, um, you know, grew up in this area. Tab's originally from like the Greensboro area. Well, they met in college, got married, and he had a job there in the school system. He's a, a school administrator. Um, but he got the opportunity to further his career by coming even closer to home. And so they moved back to Stanley County. He took a job here. And in the process, we're looking for a church. They were both believers and knew they needed to be plugged into a church. And so they came to New Life. And like these other people that uh, we were describing a minute ago, they fell in love with our church, loved what God was doing here, wanted to be a part of it. They got plugged into our church. Matt uh, originally started uh, volunteering some with uh, our worship team. Tabitha is involved in kids' life. Matt is now one of our members on our elder board, so that's just sort of grown. But over the last seven or eight years, they've invited a lot of people. But this is just one instance here recently. Matt and Tab invited Shelly. If you'll show me that one. This is Shelly and her son, Cannon. Now, she has, she has other children, but last week, Shelly and Cannon were baptized. You remember? He jumped up out of the water, nearly walked on it. All right? And that was exciting for us. Because these two people, a mother and her son, came to New Life, committed their lives to Christ, followed him in baptism, and last week, Shelley's family, they filled up nearly two rows over here on my right. They came, committed their lives to Christ, were baptized, and are now getting plugged in to our church. Why? Because two found people found them and said, come and see. And it just goes on from there, and it snowballs. You see how easy that is? And so as you leave today, here's what you're going to see. Some of you may have noticed it when you come in. But as you leave, the back wall of the foyer where we had all of the drawings and the sketches for our expansion, like, like we're... We're excited about that. I, I just about guarantee you when you come next week, we're going to be missing part of a parking lot. I, I'm expecting that this week. Um, but we took all of that down, not because it's no longer a focus, but because we realize that focusing on a building, on a structure, is not going to grow our church. But focusing on people will. People are the priority. And so when you go out today, you're going to see out on that wall... A graphic that looks just like this. And it says, every member make a member. And there are boards up with wire there. As we add people to our church, as we see people commit their lives to Christ and make a commitment to our church as members, then man, we're just going to go old school. And we're going to snap a, a literal Polaroid picture and hang it up so that you can see new people who are committed to our church. You can go up there, you see their picture, you see their names. They may be first service, they may be second service. But as we see that wall grow, and, and those pictures grow, isn't that going to be exciting? As you see that evolve, how many pictures could there be 
at the end of 2019. There could be hundreds out there. I hope, there, I hope there's not enough room on the wall to put all the pictures. Then we will build a wall. Okay? We'll build a wall. You know who's going to pay for it? We will. All right? That wasn't in the first service either. <laughs> I, I want that to be a reminder, right? But I but also want it to be a motivator. Every Sunday you go out there and you see maybe a few more pictures. And it will motivate you to keep asking, to keep compelling. Whoever it might be that God's laid on your heart, just come and see. Just come and be a part of it. You know? And so here's the, here's the challenge. I'm going to finish the rest of this message, I promise. If you have yet to take the step of becoming a member of our church... I want you to do that today, okay? I want you to take that step. Maybe you've been coming here just a few weeks, a few months, or even a few years, but you've never taken the step to say, hey, I, I want to be considered a full-fledged card-carrying member. We don't have cards, but that's what I want to be, okay? Count me in and count on me. Right after the service... Eric, our discipleship pastor, is going to be in the green room. We call it the green room because it's green. It's easy to locate. It's right out these doors to the left. Go there and say, Eric, I want to be considered a member of this church. He's going to take some personal information from you. He's going to ask you a few questions. Two of them are going to be, have you committed your life to Christ? If you have, please say yes. If you haven't, he can help you with that. The next question is going to be, have you been baptized? If you have, say yes. If you have not, he can help you with that. All right? He's going to, not at, like right then, <laughs> but he will put you on the list and we'll take care of that later. The third question typically would be, have you attended the discovery class? Well, you're probably going to say no to that one because we've not yet offered it this year. Today's message is it's like, this is the deal of the year. We are going to waive the discovery class and consider this message the discovery class and the membership class, okay? So you sort of get a freebie there. You just tell him, I want to be a member, and we're going to take your picture. We're going to take your information. We're going to put you on, on that wall, and then you're going to take home with you the responsibility of making another member, of being a found person who now has the responsibility to find somebody and, and to bring them. All right, so I want you to take that, take that seriously. And like I said, if we need to take care of other things, then we can do that, whether it be baptism or, or whatever. But we want you to be a part of our church. We want you to be a part of the purpose that we believe that, that God has given us and the vision that we have here at our church because we know that lives are going to be changed by it. People's eternities are going to be changed and altered by this, and we want you to be a part of that. All right, and then very quickly, the third thing that we can do to share in the responsibility of our church is this. All right, we pray for the growth of our church, we invite the unchurched to attend. Number three, we warmly welcome our guest. Warmly welcome our guest. This is so important. I know I've spent a lot of time on these other things, but we don't want to miss this one because failure is not an option. We cannot get this wrong. If we're all praying for the growth of our church and we're inviting people to come, our friends, our co-workers, our family members, how important is it to you? Let's make this personal. How important is it to you that when they come, that your friends, your family members, your co-workers are received by the church warmly, respectfully, and graciously? Is that important to you? It should be because that is priceless. You cannot put a number on that. And so let me just take this opportunity. I don't think this is the case, but if so, just let me cover this base. We've had a lot of guests come through this just today, even first service, and a lot of you uh, for, for this service are here for the first time. If there is anybody in this room and you're here for the first time and for whatever reason you don't feel like you've been warmly welcomed, or you feel like you've been ignored, I sincerely apologize. And I really hope that you don't believe that's who we are, because it's not. 
And I'm going to ask you right now to come back next Sunday and give us a second chance to be what we should be. All right, because I'm talking to our people right now. Guys, this is important. Who wants to invite somebody to the church if they're afraid that when that person gets to the church that their friend or their neighbor or their co-worker is going to be ignored or is not going to be uh, acted toward in a friendly manner? See, we can all help with that. Those of you who have been around quite some time, usually all, you sit in the same places every single week. That's why I know when you're out. You're like, how do you remember all that? Well, you sit in the same place. All you got to do is look right there. You're gone, you know. But look around because the people around you typically do the same thing. If you see someone sitting near or around you that's not normally there, just tap on the shoulder. Hey, how are you doing today? My name's so-and-so. Who are you? Oh, it's your first time here? Great. Hey, we're glad to have you here. Listen, if there's anything you need, let me know. I may or may not be able to help, but I can find somebody who can. It's just that easy. I understand giving people space. Guests do not want to feel like, you know, we're lighting on them like flies on poo. All right, so give some people some space. Let them relax. Don't be so overbearing and intimidating, but yet be helpful. Be kind. Love people into the church. Here's the way I like to think about it. Have you ever gone on like a luxury vacation or maybe stayed at a really nice hotel, had a really nice dinner? Yes, no. If you haven't, you should. All right, just splurge every once in a while and really treat yourself. But you'll learn something when you do. Those who serve you in those types of places act as if they were expecting you, anticipating your arrival, and they treat you as if you are the most important person in the room at the moment. We should treat our guest no less. Every single person, not just guests, but every single person that walks through the doors of this church should feel as if they are the most important person there today or that day, whatever. Warmly welcome the guests. Warmly welcome each other. It's biblical. Romans chapter 15, verse 7. This is where we're going to uh, stop today. Paul said, Welcome one another, therefore just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. It brings glory to God when we welcome each other in this way. The message translation says it this way. Reach out and welcome one another to God's glory. Jesus did it, now you do it. He gave us an example. He gave us a pattern. Let's, let's do what Jesus did. Engage the culture. Enlarge the kingdom. Pray for its growth. Invite people to come and see and to be a part. And as they do, warmly welcome them. Invite them in. Make them feel like they are the most important person there that day. That is the heart of God. That is the passion of God. And I'm telling you, church, that it must become ours. All right, so here's our action steps for today. First, if you need to become a part of the kingdom of God, to have a part yeah, or a relationship with Christ, that, that's the first step. Because as I told our first service, you can join a church, this church or any church. You could be baptized. You could go through the membership class or whatever. You could do all of that and miss heaven. Do you realize that? You can be a part of a church and miss heaven if you don't have a relationship with Christ. So we need to make sure that that is our number one priority. If that's you today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead in a prayer in just a moment uh, to help you with that. But secondly, if you have a relationship with Christ, whether or not you have been baptized, but you're ready to take that step of, uh, of membership, again, whether it's your first time here or, or you've been here quite some time, make sure you go by the green room. Fill out the information. Let Eric take your picture. Let us pin your picture to the wall today. Let's see some growth take place today. Take with you this responsibility to make a member, to invite somebody else. So that's the, that's the two main goals for today. Right now, with every head bowed and every eye closed, let's touch on that first one. If you're here today and you need to know that you have a relationship with Christ, 
Pray with me right now. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner and I'm asking you for forgiveness. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin, that you were buried and rose from the dead. And I believe that you live right now. You live eternally so that I too can live. And I invite you into my heart and life as my Lord and my Savior. And I believe that through faith in what you did for me on the cross, that you are now welcoming welcoming me into your family, God's family. If that's you today, let us know. Whether you've decided to become a member of our church or not, let us know that you've made that decision. Fill out a connection card. Take it by the green room. Give it to Eric. The reason is we want, to come by, we want to come alongside you and encourage you, support you, celebrate with you. For the rest of us, listen, if, if you've been praying about a church home, where to get plugged in, I think there's people here that's been coming for a while and, and you know that you found that place, but you've yet to, to take that step of really making a solid, memorable commitment. Don't leave today without stopping by and doing that. Take that step. And then all of us, let's get serious about making other members, making other followers of Christ. Lord, would you help us with that? We realize that this is the commission. This is the goal that you have given us. To go out and make disciples. To make followers of Jesus. To make other members and we don't want to slack on that responsibility any longer so Lord I pray that today you would you would motivate challenge and encourage us to go out and find one person one person and bring them here come and see come and see for yourself whether they come next week or the week after that or You know, it might take us months with some people. But once we find that person, we bring them. And then we go out and we find another. And by that, we know that we're going to bring glory to you. And we're going to be able to celebrate as we watch your kingdom and your church grow. God, we just want to say today that it's for your glory. We can't wait to see what that wall looks like in December 2019 knowing that it's going to be full of people, full of pictures and families who have been found. God, we want to thank you today at the beginning of this for what we know we're going to see at the end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us?